Hello my loves, welcome back to my channel, or welcome to my channel if you are new here. Hi, hello -y. my name is Loey. I can honestly say I've never had such an overwhelming response for a part two to a video as I did to my Susie Pesto TikTok stitch video that I posted last week. If you're not familiar with this, don't worry, you don't need to watch part one. There's just more of these stories in that video if you want to check them out after this one. It all started off when an influencer named Susie made a cooking video and said that you can call her crazy if you want, but she's not a fan of store-bought pesto. And people took the opportunity to stitch that original video and say, Susie, store-bought pesto is crazy. But here's a story from my life that is infinitely more crazy. The joke, of course, being that the person will tell a crazy story from their lives and Susie is calling herself crazy because she doesn't mess with store-bought pesto, right? Now, this has resulted in a lot of crazy stories, but as you probably already guessed, also a lot of scary ones. So today I have five more true TikTok story times to share with you all that truly crawled under my skin and creeped me out. But before we get into the scary TikToks today, I want to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Factor. The holidays are right around the corner, which means it's basically the busiest time of year. And I know, just like me, some of you guys don't really have all the time to go grocery shopping and cook solid meals and do all the meal prep that goes into that. With Factor, you can skip the extra trip to the grocery store and the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too all while still getting nutritious and delicious meals. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes, so all you have to do is heat and enjoy. For me, Factor has kept my fridge stocked with healthy meal options so that I'm not always ordering out after a long night of live streaming. In addition to meals, they also offer things like smoothies and juices. I'm actually drinking their apple beet and ginger cold press juice because if you can't tell, I've been feeling a little under the weather and it's number one, delicious, but number two is just just really handy to always have in my fridge whenever I need it. Head over to factor75.com or click the link in my description box down below and use my code LOWY50 for 50% 50 off of your first Factor box. Once again, that's factor75.com and code LOWY50 for 50% 50 off of your first box from Factor. Thank you guys so much for using my code. It really does help out the channel so much. And thank you to Factor for sponsoring today's video. I really appreciate it. Without any further ado, let's get into the TikToks. This first story is a paranormal one, and it comes from Glitter in Ritalin on TikTok. Our poster says that after 30 years of service, her father was getting ready to retire from the Air Force. And he, along with the poster's mom, decided they want more palm trees, less taxes, and they're going to move to South Carolina. Now, her parents actually built their home from scratch, brand new in a beautiful subdivision that was like less than 10 years old. Our poster is living only five-ish minutes away from this house at this time in her own apartment. Her mother is there by herself while her father has returned to their home state of New Jersey to finish out his time in the service. And one night, the poster gets a call from her mother asking a simple question. How much do you know about ghosts? And the poster says, lay it on me. What happened? And she goes, well, last night I woke up in the middle of the night and I got the feeling that I just wasn't alone. And the room was pitch black dark. There was no TV on, no lights on. The curtains were drawn. There was no light coming in from the street or from outside. There was nothing that could have created a haze or a glare or a reflection, but I saw a ghost. There was a figure of a woman standing in the doorway that separates the bedroom and the master bathroom. She said that this woman floated towards her and she was wearing a long dress with a big bustle in the back. And as she floated towards my mom, she didn't say anything out loud, but she sent a message. She did convey a message to my mom. And the message was, I was here first but I'm going to go now. So 
So she turns and she floats through the wall and out the window. And at this point, my mom is like sitting up and flipping the lights on and like paradise lost. So after telling this story, the poster's mom is like, I don't really understand this. Don't houses have to be old for them to be haunted or at least to have been lived in before? And the poster says, mom, you built a house in South Carolina. Like, this land has so much history. It was actually Charleston, South Carolina, by the way, like one of the most haunted places in the world. Like, there was no hope for that house not being haunted. Fast forward a few months and her mom has tried to put this out of her head and move on. And she's at a party that's kind of being attended by like the whole town, including the mayor of the town, who has been the mayor for 40 years. The poster's mom gets talking with the mayor and they start talking about the spooky stuff, right? They start talking about ghosts and hauntings. And she tells him the same story she had told the poster a couple of months prior. And the mayor is like, wow, that's crazy. Like, where do you live in town? She tells him the street and he says, oh, it sounds like you saw the huntsman's wife. Now, the poster's mother is like pretty freaked out by this and asks, who is the huntsman's wife? To which the mayor tells her this story. And he's like, yeah, you know, like where your house is standing, like that neighborhood back in the 1800s, it used to be an old plantation. And that's super common down here. Lots of modern, structure, uh, modern structures are sitting on, on what used to be old plantation grounds. He said, it sounds like your house was probably pretty close to where the original plantation house stood. He's like, there's some lore that goes with this, you know, the story is that the huntsman, the, the, you know, the man of the house, he went out to go hunting one day and he never came back and nobody knows what happened to him. But the story is that his wife is still roaming the grounds. She's still looking for him. Clearly that land had quite the history before the house was ever even built on it. And that house really didn't stand a chance to not be haunted. You're building a house in Charleston, South Carolina, and on that land specifically, there was no way you weren't going to get some kind of ghostly visitor. But I'm so interested in the story of the Huntsman's Wife. I had never heard of this urban legend slash story, I guess. And I'm really curious if that is who her mom saw or if there are any other stories around the Huntsman's Wife. Our next video I thought about saving for last because it is my favorite story that has come out of this trend on TikTok, but I feel like I just need to show it to you now. It comes from Psychic-ish Podcast on TikTok. And to me, this one sounds a bit like a glitch in the Matrix story. Our poster, who is named Lid, had the following experience when she was just 21 years old, going to university in Wellington, New Zealand, and living all around a pretty normal life. It's a totally normal night, and she has just tucked herself into bed and drifted off to sleep. And she has a really vivid dream. She says, not quite a lucid dream, but there was this sense of awareness where she knew that she was dreaming. And this is something that happens for her with dreams quite often. In the dream, she was pregnant. She could feel the baby kicking around in her body. She could literally see, of course, her stomach and her cute little bump, and she found herself getting really, really attached to this baby, even though there wasn't like a physical baby there, she knew it was inside of her. And even though she was aware this was a dream, she kind of found herself starting to get attached to this baby. But what is she gonna do? It's a dream. And in the dream, the day gets later and later and later. And Lit realizes like it's nighttime now in this dream and she's gonna have to go to sleep in what she knows is a dream. And she's kind of confused. She's like, I can't really remember ever going to sleep in a dream before, but maybe this will be what gets me to wake up. The next morning when Lid wakes up, she is not back in her bed in Wellington, New Zealand. She is still in the dream. So this cycle kind of repeats itself over the next few days. I kind of wait to go to sleep at night to hope that I'm going to wake up again. And 
I don't wake up. I'm still just in this dream. Lid is missing her family. She's missing her boyfriend. She's missing her life. She doesn't know when she's going to wake up from this dream that feels like it's been so long at this point. And then the unthinkable happens. She goes into labor. I guess it's good to say that like in all the pregnancy dreams I've had before, I've never given birth in any of them. So this was kind of like the moment I was waiting for when all this was going on. I was like, okay, well, I've never actually given birth in a dream before. So when I'm giving birth, that's when I'll wake up. But did I? Nope. <laughs> I was on the hospital bed. I started giving birth. I've also never felt pain in a dream, but I felt this. I felt every bit of the labor and I gave birth to a baby boy. I named him. I did everything that a new mother would do, which is weird because how would I know what a mother would do? I'm not a mum myself yet. And um, every day I was still kind of hoping to wake up still, like it kind of just in this weird little space. Lid has just given birth to a baby in her dream and it still wasn't enough to wake her up. She's starting to wonder at this point, am I ever going to wake up? Am I ever going to go back to like my actual reality in my life? It's around the time of her son's second birthday. Second birthday. He is two years old at this point that Lid finally accepts that she's not going to wake up. It gets to my son's second birthday and I reach acceptance. I'm like, okay, I miss my family, but I have to accept I'm never gonna see them again. This is my new life now. I have my son, this is my life. I watch him grow up. I watch him go to school for the first time. I watch him get his first crush, graduate, get married, have his own two kids. And then on the day of his 40th birthday, I throw him a surprise party. It's kind of weird to say I, there was never a father in the picture, like it was always just us two. Um, but I remember what it looked like, like there was a picnic table outside, there were heaps of trees in our backyard, we lived in a double story wooden terraced house and we were singing him happy birthday and I woke up. I was back in my bed in Wellington, no longer this like six year old woman with a 40 year old son. I was 21 in my bed about to go to uni, like I was wanting to for what felt like 40 years spent in a dream. But as I lay there when I woke up, I was happy to be back, but I missed my son. And I cried and I went through this grieving process for my son that I had raised for 40 years. And I couldn't tell anyone because I didn't want them to think I was crazy. My heart was racing the entire time I listened to this story for the first time. I cannot even imagine the roller coaster of emotions that Lid was feeling. This sounds like an episode of like Black Mirror or something. It reminded me a lot of the Reddit lamp story that we talked about in a Terror Time video previously here on YouTube, where a man realized after decades with his loving wife and children that a lamp in the corner of the room didn't look quite right, sending him back into his own reality where he had been knocked unconscious due to like an accident. Like he had dreamed his whole life and went through this crazy morning stage of feeling like he had lived this completely separate life that he could never go back to. That's what Lid's story reminded me of. A lot of people think that this was a real event. They think that she hopped timelines for a sec, went off, did what she needed to do in a different reality, and then came back. Look, I have some crazy vivid dreams too, and sometimes I'll wake up from a dream a little confused. Like, was that real? Was that just a dream? But I've never had a dream like that. You let me know down below if you have and you feel comfortable sharing, but that would scare me half to death. I wouldn't even know how to act after an event like that. 
And what's crazy is it only took one night. Like she wasn't actually gone for decades. It was only one night where all of this stuff happened. Like that is just spooky. Very, very spooky. So we're moving on. This next video comes from Debbie Oscar, who is maybe like one of the prettiest people I've ever seen in my entire life. This girl is so beautiful. Debbie says her mom has always been a pretty intuitive person. She would dream things that she couldn't have otherwise known. For example, my mom was born in a really small village in Nigeria. And in this small village, no one there had ever seen a white person before. But in her dream, she saw a man that was bearded and a white man was officiating their wedding. And when she would tell people this, people would laugh at her because again, no one had ever seen a white person and it was inconceivable for a white person to come and visit this village, right? And when Suta started popping up asking for my mom's hand in marriage, she would turn them down because she had learned to trust her dreams. And she was like, if this is not the man that I saw in my dreams, the answer is no. A few months later, my dad, who was working in Europe, decided to visit this village. And when he saw my mom from afar, he was in love, he was smitten. And so he asked for my mom's hand in marriage. And when my mom saw him, she knew this was the man from her dreams. And so she said, yes. They did the traditional wedding two days later, and then they flew to Italy where my dad was based and a white man officiated their white wedding, just like she saw in her dreams. So her mom, who literally just had the wedding of her dreams exactly as she remembered it, is now living out her life with her new husband and they start having their family. Debbie's mom had two girls, Debbie's older sisters, and when she was pregnant with Debbie, she decided not to find out the gender. Both times that she had gotten the genders of her previous children, Children. The doctors had said that they were going to be boys, but instead she got girls. However, during this time, tragedy would strike the family. Debbie's grandmother, her mother's mother, passed away unexpectedly. And Debbie's mom's sisters knew that she was heavily pregnant and they just didn't want to tell her that her mother passed away. They decided they would tell her after she had given birth. However, as we said before, Debbie's mom is a really, really gifted and intuitive person. And so one night she has a dream. So one day as my mom slept, she had a dream. And in this dream, she saw 10 bassinets and each bassinet had a baby in it. The first one had a girl and the nine after that were all boys. And so my mom in the dream was like, oh my goodness, I want a boy. And so she picked one boy and she started picking all the boys up and she was trying to pick as many as she could. She had a voice saying, drop all the boys. And she looked up and she saw her mother in the dream. And her mother came to her and said, honey, pick up the girl. And my mom was like, no, I already have two girls. I want boys. I want boys now. And the, her mother was like, I said, drop the boys and pick up the girl. And then I promise you, every boy every baby you have after this will be a boy and so my mom a bit upset dropped the boys and picked up the girl and as she picked up the girl she woke up and in that moment she knew that her mother was dead so she ended up calling her sisters who then eventually had to tell her that unfortunately their mom passed away a few months prior of course telling that to a heavily pregnant woman caused nothing but anxiety so my mom went into early labor and as she was in labor she gave birth to me but before she could even react to that the doctors noticed this mark in my ear and when my mom saw that she remembered the dream she had because her mother my grandma had the same exact mark on her right ear I think that's such a beautiful story and I think that it was just confirmation from the grandmother that she would always, always be with Debbie's mother. And like Debbie said, she literally has like marks on her body that her grandmother did. She has like the same mannerisms and voice, like they act really similar. So it really is like Debbie's mom's mom is still with her to this day. I just think that's so sweet. 
And her mother was right because after me, my mom gave birth to my brother. And then she said, four is more than enough. I'm done. Okay. And I'm sure if she had continued having kids, she would have had nine extra boys, if that makes sense. Anyway, that is crazy, but not as crazy as you, Susie, with your pesto. It's bittersweet that after everything that the sisters went through to make sure that the mom didn't know about the grandmother's passing, that she still found out anyway because her mom came to see her in her dreams, you know? I just, I think that's so special. It's such a special confirmation to have with your family, but I'm also sure it was so difficult for her to hear. I can't even imagine how many emotions you would be feeling after an encounter like that, after a dream like that, but yeah, I thought that was a really, really beautiful one. Very spooky still, but really, really sweet. The next story is from Excel Lynn, who says that when she was 13 years old, she and her sister saw something strange one night out of their bedroom window that haunts her to this day. The poster and her sister are sharing a room at this time, and the poster just kind of wakes up in the middle of the night to find that her sister is staring out their bedroom window. Our poster is freaked out by this, understandably, but her sister is like, come here, I wanna show you something. So she's looking out our window, we're peeking out of our blinds, I'm looking, I'm like, what is gonna happen? All of a sudden, it's 3 a.m., all of a sudden, a little boy, maybe four, five years old, runs down the street in his pajamas, just runs down the street past our house. And I looked at her and I said, is that a kid? She said, yes. And she's like, but wait. So I wait, and we're still peeking out the window. Then. Little boy runs back, 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 back. And you can hear his running and just goes out of sight both ways. And he's doing that. And I was like, what is happening? And she's like, he has been doing that for the last like 10 minutes. She got woken up by it, by his little pitter patter running because we would sleep with our window open. We were on the second floor. We'd sleep with our window open and she heard him. So she's been watching him. And I was like, that's creepy as hell, it's 3 a.m., why is this kid by himself? She's like, I don't know, but grab your camera. And we stick my little camera lens, like the little point and shoot, we stick it through the blinds, you know, we're open the blinds, stick it through, okay? <sighs> this little boy is running. I click record, I click record. The second I click record, this little boy stops in the middle of the street and turns and looks directly at us in the window. He just stops, turns, and looks up and we make eye contact and me and my sister just fling off the bed. We just, we, we, we jump out. We're like, what just happened? That was creepy. What spring up? She's like, oh my gosh, did you get that? And I was like, I think so. I look at my camera, it's off. My camera's off. She goes, what do you mean it's off? I said, I don't know, it won't turn on. It's just not turning on. We look at my camera again after a few minutes, it turns back on, there was nothing there. The entire time I was watching this video, I assumed that she had gotten the video of the little boy running back and forth and back and forth on the street and that we would see it in this TikTok, but it's so much creepier that she didn't get the video. The fact that the kid was doing this, just running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth on the street at three in the morning until the poster takes out her camera, the kid stops what he's doing, makes eye contact with them, and then vanishes. Like, the kid didn't hear the camera from down on the street, you know what I mean? This was very clearly something that knew it was being filmed and didn't want to be. But I thought that one was pretty creepy. The poster does say that her childhood home was pretty haunted growing up, so this probably wasn't that weird considering other paranormal experiences that they had in the home. Still, I can't even imagine seeing this in the middle of the night. The last video comes from poster Sean East, who says that while Susie's store-bought pesto might be a little crazy, he has some paranormal family drama that's pretty crazy too. Sean opens the story by saying that he knew from a really young age that if he was going to be an out, openly gay man, he wanted to do it very far away from his small, middle-of-nowhere town in Texas. He lived with his mother and the rest of his family, but his father lived in a city. So Sean goes to his mother and he says, I want to go live with my dad for a while. And eventually he makes his way to the city that his dad is living in and they start getting pretty close. 
close enough that one night Sean decides to tell him that he's gay. Basically, he was trying to ask his dad if he could spend the night at one of his like female friends' houses, and his dad was like, well, what if you guys get up to some funny business? And Sean was like, what if we don't? Basically, he takes the opportunity to tell his dad that he's not into girls like that, and yeah. And the dad takes it pretty well, but does tell Sean, never tell your mother this. Just give this some time. Don't tell her right now, though. However, one day while they're on the phone, Sean does tell his mom. And the first thing out of her mouth is like, put your dad on. Like, I want to talk to your dad. And I don't think that Sean's mom took it very well. I don't think that she acted very supportive, but that's still his mom, and he went home to spend the summer with her after this news drops. Everything seems well and good, he's spending time at home with his family, but eventually he goes to his mom and he's like, okay, I'm ready to go home to dad's house, like, I, I want to go back to my life. And that's when his mom tells him, you're not going back to your dad you're staying here. He tells her, I'm just as much my dad's son as I am your son. And that's when his mother tells him, no, you're not. Actually, your biological dad is not your, um, is not the man you know. And this was the revelation that really just, it was the biggest revelation I had ever had in my life. I mean, for 15 years, the man that I had known, everything that I had known just, it really was destabilizing. And to have it weaponized against me in a way to keep me under her control as like a punitive measure, it was just disgusting. So that summer, my mom and dad fought a lot on the phone while my dad tried to figure out my, my dad, the man that I knew as my dad tried to figure out how he was going to get me back home. To say the least, Sean has already been through a lot in his life and has had to overcome a lot of struggle just to literally be who he is. But he ends up going back with his dad, things are rocky with his mom, and now we're fast forwarding a couple of years into the future. Sean is working in Los Angeles on a reality television program, and it's a pretty stressful job. One night after work, Sean gets on to a particular dating and hookup app to let off some steam, and he meets a guy, and they decide they're gonna hang out. He winds up going to the guy's place. It's like really, really late at night, like two in the morning. And this guy lives in a not so great part of Los Angeles. And it's as Sean is trying to find his grinder hookup that he has one of the most chilling experiences of his life. And as I get out of my car, I see this guy coming up. And like, at first I was like, oh, I guess it's him. So as he, as he crosses my path, he says, Sean, and my full name, like my full government name, Sean East, what I go go by on social media is not my is not my real name. And I've been going by Sean East since I was 15. And everyone I knew in LA knew me as Sean East, except my employer or employers. And at first I was like, this must be the guy, but I distinctly don't remember him. No, I don't remember giving him my last name. This doesn't make any sense. So I, he keeps walking past me and I start to follow him and he's smiling at me and he's looking back as I, as I'm just continuing walking on, this door opens and this guy's like, Hey, get in here. And it's the guy from Grindr. I told the guy what happened and I was like, the weirdest thing just happened. And I explained it. And he was like, that is really weird. Anyways, so that Christmas, I went home to my family, talked to my mom about my dad, my biological dad. And she told me that I had uh, a stepbrother or a half brother that I'd never met and he had passed recently. And she showed me his Facebook and it had been turned into like a memorial type Facebook. And as soon as I saw the guy, I was like, I know that person. The person that I saw that night was my half brother who had already passed. Why was he trying to get me to follow him? And why did he say my name the way he said it? Because he said, Sean, with emphasis on my last name, it, as if it wasn't my real last name or like he was, I don't know. So yeah, that's my paranormal family drama. It's a crazy story about pesto. So Sean saw his half brother 
just walking on the streets of Los Angeles in the middle of the night after never seeing him before in his life, number one. Number two, he says Sean's full, like, legal name. And then number three just kind of smiles at him as he starts to walk away. Like, that is so eerie. He was clearly trying to get Sean's attention and maybe it was just like a, hey, you know, like a, like a recognition of I know who you are now because maybe he wouldn't have known who Sean was when he was alive. Sean went through so much with his family. His story really, really, really was hard to hear, but not too unfamiliar to me as a fellow queer person who grew up in the South. And I just wonder, like, what was his brother trying to say? And I wish that he had gotten some face time with his brother before he left the world. But man, what a crazy story. Way crazier than store-bought pesto. So there you guys have it. That was five more scary TikToks from the Susie Pesto TikTok story time stitch trend thing. Do you want to see another? Do you want a part three? You let me know down below. Again, I was shocked how many of you guys wanted a part two for the last one. So listen, if you show this one just as much love, you might get a part three in no time because there are new videos being posted to this trend every single day and they get crazier every single time I see them. But yeah, let me know down below. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy, go ahead and give me a thumbs up and please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. A special thank you to my subscribers who are members of the channel. If you wanna join the channel memberships and get extra members exclusive content, including members only videos, if you wanna join, there should be a little join button somewhere around the screen, probably right next to the subscribe button. We would love to have you. An extra special thank you to my VIP loves for their generous and continued support of the channel. I love and appreciate you all very, very much. I love you all very much, and I will see you in my next video. Bye!